So you can have the most brightest, shiniest, whizziest tool uh, or channel, but if the content's not updated or engaging, then I'm sorry, but your money's been wasted. That was Katie McCauley from AB Communications, and this is Remote Control. With me today on the Remote Control podcast is Katie McCauley, the Managing Director of AB, one of the UK's leading internal comms agencies, and host of the Internal Comms podcast, now in its second series. So, uh, yeah, a bit of podcast royalty today, Katie. Welcome. Thank you very much, Jack. It's a pleasure to be on the show. I noticed recently as well, I should add in that you're also now a multiple award winner, courtesy of the Institute of Internal Comms. Oh. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, they gave me a change maker award at their award ceremony a couple of weeks ago, which was uh, really lovely, actually. Not I didn't expect it. Um, someone here had nominated me and put the entry in. And uh, yes, I had to rush out and buy a new dress. So it was lovely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect. Yeah, it was great. Well, I'm really excited to have you on the show. So we're going to start talking about remote working and some of the challenges it poses and the, the trend of remote working that is growing. And I think when we first started talking about this, I was really struck by the roll call of, of your clients. And so I thought really you'd be able to give some pretty unique insight into how some of the biggest brands in the UK and beyond uh, get into grips with the, the change in employee preference for where they work really so yeah really excited to talk to you about this this subject yeah no I'm, I'm very excited I think you're right I think you know a lot of our clients they they have a large remote workforce and when I say remote I mean in different ways so for example if you're Royal Mail you've got you know maybe 150,000 people who are pounding the streets of the UK if you're KPMG you've got people working client side so they're remote in that way although they might have lots of lots of access to technology so yes absolutely I think all of our clients have that challenge one way or another so it's a really fascinating topic for us. So let's kick off with an easy one, but one that's pretty fundamental to this whole remote control podcast is the question, do you work remotely and is that kind of common across AB? Yes, I do work remotely and it is fairly common across the agency. I guess I'm one of those lucky people that for me work is very much now a thing I do rather than a place I go. Um, and that's true for, I, I guess, a lot, a lot of people, particularly on the agency side. Um, I would just say, though, as managing director, of course, a lot of my job involves just simply listening to people, interacting with them, not necessarily about the task, but around the task. And that informal interaction is quite hard to do remotely. So although I could work remotely, I do find myself coming in usually four days out of five um, to get that interaction. But um, yes, I definitely do do it. And it makes a big difference from a work-life balance point of view. Yeah, I can totally understand what you mean about the difference in the informal communication and just catching up with people where I work is much easier when you're in the office. You can kind of see them over the other side of the office, kind of have a chat about what went on over the weekend, whereas someone who's can maybe fully remote or 90% remote working, it's almost a extra effort on your behalf to engage with them via kind of maybe instant messenger, uh, kind of a voice call. It's it's there's an extra process in place, and I think it's kind of working that into your behaviour that it isn't an extra effort. It's you know, it's just kind of one of those things that, that happens. And it's, yeah, it's definitely a change that I think a lot of people are getting on board with. Yeah, I mean, I think you're right. You have to be more intentional about that um, formal, rather informal interaction. You have to be much more intentional about that because it doesn't just happen automatically as it would as you're stood around the coffee machine, for example. So, um I think it's worth bearing that in mind when you do work remotely and particularly when you manage remote workers as well. But I think at AB, one of the things we have on our side, which is quite lucky, is we were founded as a family firm. We were founded by um, a husband and wife, actually, back in the 1960s and their son then in the 90s. Um, And so the uh, importance of putting family first, of getting the work-life balance right, is kind of almost baked into our DNA, even though we're not now um, owned by the same family, as it were. And I think the heritage of that and the values of that um, are sort of baked into who we are. 
So that, again, makes it easier and more acceptable from a cultural point of view, which I think is also quite important. Yeah, and I guess, I mean, and it is a, just a guess from, you know, having been set up that way, and it feels like there'd be a lot of maybe processes or policies for, you know, one of less stuffier words, but uh, in place that kind of helps that informal communication, the, I like the, the word of intentional, being intentional about communicating with people, even if it is considered to be chit chat it is much more than that it's that kind of culture piece it's making people feel engaged and and valued and just because they're not sat in front of you there's no reason why they should miss out I guess yes exactly I think there's been some research done around remote remote working um, which suggests that the conversation that happens before the meeting and the conversation that happens afterwards in the corridor is equally as important as what is actually discussed in the room or on the call and that's the stuff you miss out if you're just dialing into the call because that's the stuff around building relationship bonding with your colleagues it's about the stuff that kind of is you know tangential to it but it's still really very important to understand so how i've had people actually deliberately start conference calls early with a conversation around what people have just been up to to get that informal chit chat going um because as i say it's very important to just relationship building which is at the heart of the business i like i like the thought of almost having um kind of the the informal chat almost like an agenda point it's uh that's quite a, a unique way of looking at it yeah i think it's really really important actually and it gets uh it gets forgotten about i think it's probably a point we'll come back to i'm sure yeah definitely One of the key reasons to start this remote control podcast was the research from Office for National Statistics that suggests that 50% of the workforce will be working remotely in 2020. So I just thought that was a a crazy, to me that seemed like that was huge and and not true. But then I just looked around the office at Stream Go and I thought, actually, yeah, every, every person in this office will be working from home, from a client, from, you know, a different space than the office this week. And yeah, I mean, if that's happening in ours, it must be happening kind of across the country. So, yeah, that really kind of hit home. And, mm-hmm. yeah, that's why I kind of wanted to speak to experts and professionals like you, like yourself, really, is to get a grip on what change is being seen and being felt by the internal comms professionals out there. Yeah, I mean, we're definitely seeing it. I mean, I think one thing, and I also saw that research, actually, from I think Morrie's done it and the Office for National Statistics has done it to say by 20... Uh, 20 that 50 percent of the workforce i think will be able to work remotely or will be and a part of that also obviously is the rise of the gig economy i think you've got 12 percent of the workforce who are freelancers and then you've got another 10 percent potentially nearly 10 percent now who are in the gig economy and they tend to be people again who don't have an office you know so we're definitely seeing that increase And I I suppose one of the things I've noticed since I've been working over the last sort of 25, 30 years, it really has been that long, um, is the, um, you know, it's more generally acceptable to do it. Um, People have lost that notion of presenteeism. You know, you have to be present to be working. And now when you dial into a conference call or a video conference call, you don't expect someone to be sat in an office block. And that's partly due to the, extortionate uh, rates that you're charged now for real estate in most of our sort of big cities around the world so it just makes sense not to have people sat in those office blocks so I think that's that's part of it I think the I think we just need to be a little bit careful here because obviously there are a lot of people that um still have to go into the shop floor of whatever that shop floor looks like, whether it's retail estate or whether it's factories or manufacturing where they don't have that luxury. So I just, I wouldn't want to turn this into a um, a two tier conversation because I think that's also quite important to consider as well. But for those that are able to do it, I think the challenge potentially that I see organisations grapple with is particularly around collaboration and it's really what we were talking about before um you can do the task probably better if you're sat somewhere quiet potentially at home with less distractions but it's how do you collaborate around the task so how do you replicate as we were saying the power of a face-to-face conversation um 
So when I look at the technology, I'm not sure that organizations are moving as quickly as they need to for the way that we want to be running our lives. So I look at email, for example. We've been talking about the death of email for the last you know, 20, 30 years, we are still sending a lot of email. We haven't yet, yet, I think, moved to a situation where we're exchanging information in online discussion forums, um, within social collaboration tools. Um, we're still relying, I think, largely on long email chains, which is not helpful. So I think from my perspective, those organizations that have cracked it for their employees who can work remotely, they bake in the technology from the word go. So um, I'm thinking of one client in particular is an accountancy firm where it's hardwired into every meeting room um, that you are going to be talking and collaborating with people who aren't sat in the room. Yeah. And the technology is there from the beginning. When you join the organization, you're given your suite of mobile apps. You know what each of those are for. It's on your device or it's on the company device, but they're intuitive, they're engaging, they're obvious. So those are the organizations for me that have cracked it because technology is enabling it rather than this kind of crazy situation where we've got 20, 20th century technology and 21st ways of wanting to work. Yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting way in looking at it. And it probably or, or definitely affects the recruitment policy of these firms as well. So if that example that you, you mentioned there, there's the technology there to to foster this collaboration with remote working and they're out at the client site or or just working from a different office it's a, a kind of i guess looking at how in the recruitment process how people kind of adapt to technology or those different situations and uh, yeah i guess that's kind of a, a separate side of remote working that uh, i've not thought about before yeah, and, and it's important not to be ageist about it. So one of my podcasts is, was with a guy that used to head up internal comms at B&Q who found that his most active people on his internal social platform were actually the over 55s because they had experience of products and services B&Q was share, were, were selling that they wanted to share with their colleagues. And they just started to make little videos and share them with the rest of the organization. So um, explaining to employees very early on what's expected of them and how to use the channels and what they're there for is really, really important. And I think to do that from the induction is, again, very important. And, and how you actually introduce people to your organization and onboard them should be done uh, in a way that's on their device and on an application that suits them. So from the word go, you're explaining that, yes, if you want to work remotely, we can do it and these are the tools. No, yeah, that's so cool. I mean, uh, that's another kind of great story. It just strikes me as that segment of, of workers at, at B&Q really wanted to share their experience and, and a message and that desire kind of uh, yes. you know, paved the way through different technology or different groups and I think that's probably quite a common thread amongst things amongst people that work well either in the office or remotely is that desire to to share that experience and connect with co-workers and I think if there's that drive there to share those experiences or learn from people then it's going to go a long way to meet or to make up for any kind of technology deficits or processes that haven't been put in place by the company. I think the problem is that a lot of people turn on platforms, like, for example, they'll turn on Yammer because Yammer is part of Office 365. And so, you know, well, well it, it comes as part of that package. Let's turn it on. And you turn it on and it's like, and in fact, the guy from B&Q said this, it's like saying, well, um, you know, you invite people to a football pitch, but you don't explain the rules of the game. Um, you don't explain how to win. Um, and you expect people to just spontaneously start playing. It's like, uh, okay, what are we doing? here and I think that's the common feeling when you just turn on a platform um, and just think oh well people are just going to spontaneously start having these really meaningful productive conversations uh, no <laughs> you have to go away you have to help you have to um, show what good looks like um, so you, you do have to do some groundwork I think that's the only thing I would say yeah maybe putting a bit of structure around that enable people to to be specific and like you mentioned right at the beginning allow people to be intentional about their communication yes. Yes. Uh, yeah no i really like that and some great examples there have you seen examples where it's not you mentioned anecdotally people turning on tools and not do it have you seen examples where companies have 
realized that this is going wrong and, and try, had to try and pivot to something else or you know something that's not kind of gone gone really well straight out of the box and what have they done to kind of turn it around yeah i mean we get called in a lot to do channel audits so you'll have a situation where an organization through time has collected a series of channels they don't all talk to each other some of them um someone set up a while ago and that person's left and so no one knows how to update that channel and what it's really there for so all of this needs sorting out and so what we tend to do in those situations is work out which ones are actually working for which audience groups and sort of do a bit of a segmentation exercise and work out where the gaps are i think the big thing for me that's changed recently is intranets so you know intranets historically were these kind of sort of archived uh, yeah, old libraries sort of dusty archived information that no one really ever went to and most of the stuff was out of date and, and completely impossible to navigate and we still find those internets exist inside organizations what we're seeing more of now is um you know mobile apps so things like staff base things like speak app um on people's phones where they can do all the things an internet is ever designed to do but in a much more intuitive and engaging way and it sits in the palm of their hand and that's for me i think is a is a, a big big step change but again i don't think you can just turn those things on and expect them to work there's a lot of work to do in the lead up to launching something like that to work out exactly how it's going to work for your organization and your audience and that takes research so normally what we do with organizations is we'll do the it audit now normally that means when people hear that it's like oh we're going to audit systems and processes oh no 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 we're going to look at the audience and we're going to ask them how do you how do you use technology when do you use technology what kind of technology um what works for you and how do you consume the information outside of work yeah. because that's where we need to set the bar when it comes to internal comms um, and once you've got all that information, then designing things very much around the audience rather than around the organisational needs, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, totally. I think that you've just been talking there about kind of interviewing the audience and it brought to mind a story that I heard from somewhere else that I've worked where we talked about internal comms. It was for product launch. You know, how can we get everyone in, everyone in the company you know, really geared up towards this product launch, get those key messages out there that are going to take to market? and uh, inevitably start talking about mobile and it's like yes okay well that's great we could produce an app or look at push notifications uh, and then kind of someone in the meeting room said yes but 50 percent of your audience are told to put their mobile phones in their drawers for the day yeah uh, so it's kind of like yeah it seems like a great idea because sure everyone uses mobile phones but it's not it, yeah that was very close to kind of going further down the line without kind of really considering the practicalities of it and like you say, just by talking to the audience there, it would have kind of brought that up very quickly. Well, there's a there's a, an award-winning magazine called Life at KPMG, which we produce. We actually just won a, a set of awards from the Institute of Internal Communications a couple of weeks ago. But an earlier version of that magazine was called Highlights. And at the time, the, all of the audience were connected. They all sat behind a screen, either at a KPMG office or somewhere else on, client, on the client side. Yeah. But every time we researched the audience, they said, please, 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 can we also have printed copies? Because I am so sick of staring at a screen. I would love a printed copy to take away with me, to read on the train, not to be sat in front of another screen reading something. It would feel like a joy, a break. And so we kept printing copies as well as delivering it digitally. So asking the audience is so important you will get that insight um that you need to actually deliver something that's going to work for them so um yeah i'm a big advocate of that yeah and i think harks back to kind of a conversation on a previous episode where it feels like internal com is very much kind of rubbing shoulders with uh, external comms these days in terms yeah. of sophistication the strategy behind it the i really you know, Kind of hang on to this word intentional that intentional uh, being intentional about what the communications is external comms and marketing has, has had that for a long time there's been lots of theories put in place and policies and tools and it really seems like internal comms now is kind of sitting at the same table 
Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, that was actually a, the topic of, a, of my speech at the CIPR Inside conference last week in Birmingham was the, was the convergence of internal and external communication. And in some ways, internal comms is a fairly young profession still. And if you look at some of the established ways that marketeers go about doing what they do, or the way that, say, advertising, the success of advertising is measured, for example, either above or below the line, there's kind of commonly established ways of doing that. And I would say that that's only just starting to come through in internal communications. Um, so in some ways, it would appear with convergence that I see lags behind external. In other ways, I think we're ahead of the curve. So when it comes to making a lot out of very a very small budget, we are excellent at that. Um, when it comes to jumping through lots and lots of hoops to get something spot on that deals with a lot of sensitivity, um, we're very good at that as well. So it, it's quite ironic in a way, but if you work in internal communications, um, it's much harder to get something signed off often than it is for some from a, for a big above-the-line advertising campaign because there's so many stakeholders and it gets very complex. So, um, yeah. It, it, convergence is really interesting, but I'd say there's pros and cons on both sides in terms of strengths and weaknesses, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. It's um, yeah, really interesting to see how it's been progressing and feels like there's a real big launch pad there for people to, yeah. to make this jump. And it's potentially catching up on the youth of the profession side of things in terms of the strategy and the planning around it will then very quickly enable people to, to identify the right tools and processes to put in place that really allow this internal comms boom to happen, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, for me, the big win, uh, if you're an IC person and you're thinking, what do I bring to the table, is employee insight. So we talk a lot and we do a lot of research every year, every organisation, no matter what they sell, you know, whether it's services or products, we'll be doing a lot of customer and client insight and bringing that to the table to help develop new products, new marketing strategies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but who is bringing employee insight to the table? Because employees have this tremendous wealth of knowledge about um, what the organization does, how it does it, how it could do it better, and who is bringing that to the table. And then for me, that's where I see really has um, a huge opportunity to bring something new and interesting, um, you know, in, into the sort of uh, into the conversation. So I want to talk a little bit now around perhaps it's kind of more of a relationship side of things. But I was reading some research that said that. 56% of employees believe that managers need to adapt their skills to manage the remote workflow. So it's clear that it's not just, right, now that your team are working in different areas or you're a global manager now, so the teams have always been working where they are, but the restructure of the business has now meant that you're kind of managing across different regions. I'm just wondering if you've seen how you've come across people that have been into these management roles or the structures changed so they're now managing kind of people remotely what kind of work has there been done to to adapt new skills and, and, and training? Yeah, training is a huge part of it. So all the research in IC suggests that um, we still worry quite a lot as IC professionals about the capability of line managers and middle managers to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, and we still feel that there's more training required. I think the answer lies in supporting managers to create a regular cadence of communication throughout the week and months so that there is a there is a very clear schedule for remote workers they know the purpose of every call they dial into or every webinar that they um, that they that, that they that they're part of i would also encourage um we've seen this happen very successfully with um the post office for example which is a separate organization now to uh, royal mail but with sub postmasters you know there's 11,000 something like that sub postmasters maybe 14,000 across the country they're all remote workers if you like yeah. but delivering products and services and the brand of the post office literally across um the whole of great britain and what we did for them was we created a one minute a one minute video uh, called the week in one and if you whoever you were if you missed out on all these different emails and all these newsletters all you had to do was dial in or, or download watch this one minute film and it had a ticket tape at the top so you could see you really were we were just taking up one minute of your time so i think from a comms perspective it's about 
a regular schedule that makes sense and there's clear objectives for everything you're dialing into so you know what, when, how and why. But then it's saying, we know your time is precious and we're going to value your time and you do need one single source of the truth. So we are going to provide you that just in case you get completely blown away <laughs> by all the millions of things we're trying to ask you to consume in an average week because it's a very, very noisy world out there. And I see internal comms is just part of that noise that they'll be, um, you know, they'll be drowning under the weight of potentially. Yeah, I mean, that, that's really cool. And it makes me think of the, the BBC News app when I wake up in the morning, kind of flick to that and the the first link on there is the you know if you need to know these only five things and it's you know quite a, a succinct summary of, of what's kind of been in the news so yeah that's kind of a really cool play on that for internal comms yeah i think it's just about making it really clear that you know so for example i do a friday update at ab i mean it's not it doesn't sound strategic it's not strategic it literally is at the same time every friday and i've heard people say if I'm on holiday, I'll just quickly look at that on workplace just to check it out so I'll know what's happened and what I've missed. Yeah. So it's just providing that easy touch point um, for people because, as I say, it's, it's it's a really noisy world out there. Yeah, definitely. And, yeah, it keeps coming back to the the purpose, making sure there's kind of a set reason for the communication and that everyone is aware of it. It's not kind of a secret reason to the person that's called, called the meeting or uh, kind of set the agenda. And that, that, that's really interesting. And yeah, like I said kind of the purpose and, in, and intentional words keep cropping up. Yes, yeah, we have a theme there, I think. <laughs> I was just wondering, um, we've talked a little bit about kind of the challenges of remote working for, for businesses and internal communications professionals. Just wondering on the flip side of that, what type of opportunities do you think are out there for people to kind of really benefit from the desire for remote working? Well, I think this is so exciting because um, potentially, if you really think about it, you could have, you know, world class individuals, what people are absolutely at the top of their game in any kind of training room, meeting room, um, virtually. And it enables you then to just, yeah, just ensure that the very best people are having that conversation around the topic at hand, no matter who they are and where they are, um, because they don't have to travel vast distances to, to be there. And I think that's I think that's potentially really exciting. I think the other thing that doesn't get talked about enough is reducing organisations' carbon footprint as well. Um, if you think about how often we have to fly people around the world or just take transport to get to places, and, and if, if that can be improved, that would be tremendous as well. So I do see um, huge opportunities and to keep hold of talent. Yeah. So we lose talent because it's very expensive to live in London. We lose talent for that reason. And if there was a way that we could really crack remote working in the future, then we wouldn't lose so much talent. So I think there's, yeah, it's, it's, it's huge opportunities. Um, I, interestingly, on my podcast very recently, had two people that job share. So not intentionally exactly the same as what you're talking about with remote working, but they do spend half the time in the office and half the time not in the office. Yeah. They're not actually working then, but nevertheless, they've got work on their mind. And one thing that came very clear to me in that conversation was the time that they are spending away from the office is crucial in enabling them to do a better job when they're in the office. So that time away from the problem and the conversations enable them to assimilate and think about and put into order their thoughts and ruminate on things. And they're absolutely convinced it makes them better in their job as a result. So I think that's one thing we don't get, we don't talk about a lot, but the time away from the hubbub and the busyness, yeah. although that's dangerous sometimes because you're missing out on some of that informal collaboration that I think is the the kind of m where the magic sometimes happens of a new idea. On the flip side, you probably, from a work life balance and a mental health point of view, and just solving the problem from a mental perspective, um, maybe you're benefiting in that way as well. Yeah, and I think that's a really good point you just touched on at the end in terms of mental health, the work-life balance, the, the mindfulness, maybe coupled with that carbon footprint angle as well as some real 
ethical reasons why remote working is good for the business as well as any linked financial performance and, and talent retention. But those bigger companies that have these goals for their CSR goals, then yeah, it's it's certainly something to consider and and I guess invest in the technology to help remote working because it will it will have a benefit for these kind of CSR goals and, and objectives that they're, that they're set out at the beginning. Yeah, I mean, if you think, you know, all that ma- in the future, is it possible that all that matters to you is finding the most talented person to do the job and, you know, and, and where, potentially where they live, where they do the work, potentially even what language they speak, even potentially because technology is going to wipe away so many boundaries and allow you just to bring talent to bear on the problem i think that's i think that's quite exciting we're not there yet we're not there yet but potentially that could, could be where we where we end up i think yeah i think you can see little pockets of these totally remote companies kind of springing up and it's probably no great surprise that they're originating on the west coast of the u.s and kind of spreading out from there but yeah i think we're seeing them grow and grow and yeah hopefully become more commonplace really yeah i mean i just had someone on the podcast it hasn't come out yet it will come out next week who um used to run an internal communications agency in the uk and a decade ago set one up in india and is now serving big international brands and other advertising and communications agencies um by you know they're, they're, they're basically outsourcing work to him so they're doing it, he's doing it all remotely. He's got the slight advantage of the time difference as well. But that model um, enabling um, the, you know, the UK agencies, if you like, to concentrate on the high value conceptual work where some of the more, um, you know, mechanical stuff, if you like, rudimentary stuff can be done somewhere else. I think it's quite interesting as well. So that quite outsourcing now has, has, has really shifted and has become, you know, a very common way that we think about how to run our businesses. Yeah, no, definitely. Um, so I've got kind of a, a couple more questions that I want to ask. And, and one of them we've, we've touched on and we'll just maybe go into a little bit more detail, but it's maybe a, a little bit more kind of conversation around successful uses of the kind of technology that you've seen brands use or maybe that you yourselves use at AB? Yes, I mean, I, I would just say up front that when clients come to us and they say, you know, what's a technological solution? What's the channel? Um, my first question is, well, what's the objective? <laughs> because yes. I, do, I do see uh, some organisations are becoming almost like Clapham Junction. You know, they've got so many platforms. <laughs> They don't know what to do with them all. So, again, it does come back to that word intentional. But, for example, at AB, um, we started, we, we, we introduced Workplace by Facebook, um, and we had something like a 98% adoption rate in about two hours. Um, so that's because, obviously, people know intuitively how to use Facebook, so therefore they know how to use Workplace. I would say that's great for for a certain type of communication. So that's around collaboration. So where you want to enable people to create groups, share information, share ideas, and not rely on those big email chains. And where you want to create a bit of communication, um, a community around something. I think something like Workplace works very well, and I'm sure in the future we're going to see rivals to that platform that are equally as you know as good, if, if not better. Workplace by Facebook is not so great if you've just come back from a two-week holiday and you want <laughs> to go straight to the place where you find out what you've missed. Um, and for that, I would say you want something like um, Staffbase, which is more of a mobile intranet. So that's an all-singing, all-dancing application on your mobile phone that gives you a lot more than just a collaboration tool uh, or something like Speak App, which is a, 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 another IC app. So I think there's horses for courses, and I think it's really important to break down the problem and find the, find the best in breed technological solution for you. And it's the same with virtual meeting rooms as well. So, um, you know, there's some very basic ones. There's some really amazing exciting rooms that you can walk into or that you can be dial into again it absolutely will depend on um you know your audience your objectives your budget your timelines and all those things have to be considered i think um 
So I don't know if that answers the question, but yeah, research really, really well first. It's so important. And um, go and ask people as well what works yeah. well in their organisation, because I don't think we necessarily do enough sharing, and that would be quite useful, I think, to do more of. Yeah, no, that, that makes total sense and um, kind of mirrors quite a lot of answers um, to that question that I've had in terms of people aren't waving a tool around saying this is going to be the solution to kind of all the internal commons problems for people in this office that office remote workers it's yeah it's like unless you've got that plan and that strategy and the reason for the communication then the tool and the technology is you know a, a distant second behind that yeah i mean i you know research and then content so you can have the most brightest shiniest wizziest tool uh, or channel but if the content's not updated or engaging then i'm sorry but your money's been wasted equally we all know that there are things in our personal lives we spend time reading or watching and it's not because it's delivered on some bright shiny tool it's because we really want that content it ent entertains us it's highly informative we're really into it so i would say relevancy um comes first you know bold relevant brave content that is really fit for purpose for the audience um great storytelling concentrate on that as much as finding the bright shiny channel because a html email you know that is sent to exactly the right people at the right yeah. time with fantastic stories um, and you know that they're clicking on it as soon as they get it because that's what the MailChimp stats are telling you is going to work just as well. So, um, at, you know, really scrutinize your data and find out what's working today. Do more of that. And then I'd say there's certainly, I bet, lots of organizations have certain channels they could just turn off. Turn yeah. off tomorrow and we complain. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I mean, harken back to kind of your example about um, KPMG Highlights. That's not a shiny or brand new tool, a physical printed kind of magazine, but it's exactly what the audience are asking for. So, yeah, you're dead right. It's uh, it's kind of making sure that that content is reaching the people at the right time with that right message. And, yeah, it, it can, can be as old fashioned as print. Yeah, absolutely. Print. We've been talking about de uh, the death of print for as long as I can remember. And we, I don't know, I think something like. 25% of the stuff we do is still is still printed. Um, and for an, a remote workforce, when that's sent to their homes, you know, you wouldn't think of print being a remote solution. But if mm. something pops through your door um, and it's something that you can read in your own time, that you can share with your family, it doesn't have a firewall, doesn't need power, you can pick it up and put it down wherever you are. Um, wow. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Where can I buy one of these things? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. So this is uh, kind of the, the, last, the last question. And I think some of the kind of podcast guests fear that they'll be judged the most on their answer to this one. But don't worry, it's a judgment-free zone. But I just, I couldn't do a, a podcast called Remote Control without asking what it is on your TV that you're watching and would you recommend it? Right. I'm, I'm going to say up. Oh. Front, I do a lot more listening than I do watching. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, so, um, I, so one thing I am watching at the moment. I'm the only one I think in uh, only one in the world that doesn't hasn't been watching Fargo. So I have to go back to the beginning on Netflix and realise why everyone talks about how brilliant that is. So, but I am much more of a consumer of podcasts, funnily enough, than I am of TV. Um, right. So going to give your uh, listeners a couple of really good things to check out that I've just thought, oh my goodness me, this is just so useful. So um, people may know Tim Ferriss, the Tim Ferriss show, because um, he's probably up there with some of the greatest podcasters of all time. Yeah, but uh, if you're interested in how to get more done in your day, then check out his interview with a guy called David Allen, who's the author of Getting Things Done. Um, it blew me away when I listened to it about two weeks ago, and uh, I was just taking notes the whole time. But yes, if you're worried about that you're not getting enough done in an average day, week, year, that's one to listen to. And the thing that I'm listening to on the way to work at the moment is Black Box Thinking by a guy okay. called Matthew. Um, 
it's been out for a while. It won't be a new book to a lot of your listeners. But if it's one of those that's kind of, you've got it on your wish list on Amazon, um, I would recommend it. It's basically saying that talent isn't necessarily irrelevant, but talent is definitely not enough. And you need what he calls a kind of growth mindset, which means you've got to allow yourself to fail. Put yourself in a position where you will embrace failure, which is one thing in IC we really hate doing, and then learn from it. Um, and so a lot more A-B testing, a lot more, well, let's try it this way and change things in flight um, to yeah. see if it's going to work better another way, I think is um, really where we need to move to. So, uh, yeah, there's, there's a couple of hot tips there. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, I appreciate that. That's, that's great. Thank you very much. Well, yeah, I really appreciate you coming on to the, the podcast, Kate. It's been absolutely fascinating. The time's totally flown by. Um, I think I'll be using the word intentional in in every single conversation I have now, it's kind of ingrained in there. But yeah, really enjoyed having you on. Thank you very much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for inviting me.